Welcome to EPG Patishala in Computer Science. This is a series of lectures in computer networks. So, we have been looking at some wireless uh, technologies. As part of that, in today's module, we will be looking at cellular networks. So, we will look at the basics of cellular networks and we will look, so we'll start from the second generation of the cellular networks. So, we will look at the 2G basics, then we will also look at the architecture of uh, 2G cellular network and we will look at how mobility is handled in 2G networks. Okay, so, let us start with the principle of a cellular network. So, it is basically the underlying technology for all our mobile phones, personal communication systems, wireless networking and so on. And it is been basically developed for mobile radio and telephone. Uh, initially, it was meant to replace these high power transmitter receiver systems that we had. Uh, typically, it supports about 25 channels over 80 kilometers. And the idea is to use low power, shorter range and more transmitters. So, the reason we are talking about high power versus low power uh, transmitters is that initially when they started off with wireless networking, you had one single huge transmitter for an entire area like a city and all receivers were connecting to that one single transmitter in order to transmit data to each other. So, obviously, this was not a very viable solution because you needed a lot of power to be able to communicate with these uh, with that central uh, device. So, which is why the idea of dividing an entire region into small cells and using multiple uh, antenna in each of these things was proposed and that is how the cellular technology was born. Okay. So, the basic idea that we have in uh, cellular network is that we have multiple low power transmitters typically 100 watts or less. So, the entire area is divided into what are called as cells. Each has its own antenna and each has its own range of frequencies on which it will operate. And each area is served by a base station. Uh, so, it has a transmitter, a receiver and a control unit. Adjacent cells, um, they work on different frequencies in order to avoid the crosstalk. So, obviously, two adjacent cells cannot use the same set of frequencies because that would uh, end up in some kind of an interference. So, adjacent cells use different frequencies. So, this is the basic idea that is used. So, the uh, overall cellular network structure would look like this. You have these cells, you can see that the area is divided into cells. Uh, there is a central uh, base station, the device, the different devices could talk to that base station using a wireless network, right? It is a cordless connection that you have. And these base stations are connected to a mobile uh, telephone switching center, right? Which is called the MTSC. There is some information that is maintained at these uh, switching centers. So, which is called as the HLR and VLR. HLR stands for the Home Location Register, VLR stands for Visitor Location Register. So, the Home Location Register keeps track of the uh, different details about the subscribers who are subscribed to this particular MTSC. VLR keeps track of those uh, nodes or those users who are visiting this particular location. So, remember that uh, with the um, cellular network, we support mobility and people can move from one area to another and also from one um, within the range of one MTSC or within the uh, what, what do you say within the control of one MTSC to another MTSC. So, when you have uh, users moving from one MTSC to another, another MTSC, the details of those who are visiting that area is kept in the visitor location register. Okay. And then this MTSC will be connected to the public switch telephone network, the PSTN network. So, which is now connected to the rest of the different other networks. So, it is only through the MTSC that you get connected to PSTN and you get, are able to um, make calls to other uh, telephone networks. Okay. So, this is the basic structure. Okay. So, if you look at the cell um, geometry, the cellular geometry is as such, you could have for instance a square pattern, you have uh, the antenna right at the center right? and you can have for instance adjacent cells which are all square in shape. So, what happens in this case is you can see that for the ones which are, di which are um, horizontally and vertically adjacent, the distance between two of them will be d, between the two centers will be d. Whereas, if you look at the diagonally adjacent ones, you can see that the distance will be 1.414 d, right. So, it will be more than um, what you have over here. So, you find that there is some kind of a, um, heterogeneity, right, in terms of how the uh, distances are. So, in order to kind of um, avoid this and avoid certain pa certain problems that occur with respect to transmitting a different um, frequencies when you have these this kind of a geometry, we go in for a hexagonal pattern. So, if you go for go in for a hexagonal pattern, you can see that each cell will have um, 6 neighbors 
and the distance to each of the neighbors, right, to the center of each of the neighbors, you can see will be a constant d. So, it becomes easier for us to handle the, um, the adjacency and handle various uh, things as we will see in uh, with respect to cellular networks, right, when you have this kind of a geometry. So, the hexagonal pattern is what is chosen. So, now one of the very important aspects of cellular network is this idea of reusing the frequency, okay. So, we said that there will be a set of frequencies that are there for each cell and the same set of frequencies can be reused by another cell provided that cell is not adjacent to the current, the current cell, right. Because obviously, if they are adjacent you cannot reuse the same frequency because there will be interference. But if the, if these uh, frequencies are reused at a cell which is a little away from it, so that it will not interfere, the signal from one will not interfere with the other, you can reuse the frequencies. The advantage of doing this re reuse will be that you will be able to increase the number of users that you can support overall. Okay, and you are able to be make better use of the available bandwidth that we have. Okay. So, with frequency reuse the um, points to remember are this, the power of the base transceiver will be controlled. Now, why should this be controlled? It is controlled such that it will allow communication within the cell on the given frequency. You have to also make sure that this the um, power is not very high that it goes and interferes with some other transmission that is taking place on the same frequency some other cell which is a little far away. Okay. So, you have to limit the escaping power to the adjacent cells. So, that is one thing. Okay. Um, so, that is something that you gain by having your the power of the base transceiver uh, in a controlled manner. Okay. And of course, this allows us to reuse the frequencies in nearby cells. So, you can use the same frequency for multiple conversations. So, typically we have about 10 to 50 frequencies per cell and uh, for example, if you had n cells all using uh, same number of frequencies as such and k is the total number of frequencies which are used in the system. So, each cell let us say has k by n frequencies. Okay. Now, uh, for instance, in uh, in AMP is just the first generation uh, cellular networks, you you could have a value of k as 395 which means you had k different total number of frequencies available is 395 and you had about n equal to 7 n cells having the same frequency. So, we will we'll see how this um, these n cells, these 7 cells are actually chosen. So, totally you get about 57 frequencies per cell on average. Okay. So, this is the idea. Right. So, let us look at these different frequency reuse patterns that are available. So, we could have a very simple reuse pattern of 4. So, you can see for instance, I take this cell here 1, right. So, 1 the adjacent cells here, you can see that adjacent cells cannot use the same frequency. So, you cannot have if I say 1, 2, 3 and 4 are 4 different sets of frequencies, right. Uh, then you will find that adjacent to 1, you will never find another 1. You will either see a 2, a 3 or a 4, a 2, a 3 or a 4. Okay. Similarly, with respect to 2, you will see 1, 3, 4, 1, 3, 4. Okay. You will not see other the same frequency anywhere adjacent to this. Okay. So, this is one kind of a re reuse pattern where your uh, n is equal to 4. Okay. Now, let us look at another reuse pattern where n is equal to 7 in the, as in the example that we, uh, we just alluded to last in the previous uh, slide. So, here you will see that there are 7 different frequencies. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7 sets of frequencies. Okay. And the first set you can see if this is set 1, you will find that none of the adjacent cells have the values, value that is used by 1. So, it is either 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay. Same thing you can see for all. And where is the next cell which is using a frequency of 1, frequency set of same as 1, you can see that it is at least about 3 cells away. Okay, so, the reuse distance that we have, right. So, you can see that it is being the, 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 the cell which is using the same set of uh, frequencies a little further away. Here you will see that it is just about 2 cell distance, right. From here to here, there is about a 2 cell distance, okay. So, um, as we increase the reuse pattern, the n value, right, um, you will find that the distance that we have between 2 different cells using the same set of frequencies increases. So, which means that you have better separation of the frequency. So, it becomes easier to build the transmitters at, at in these um, different in each of these cells. Okay. So, this is one thing. So, you can see that if I use an even larger value of n, say let us say I use a value of n equal to 19, okay, you can see that the uh, distance is even larger, right. So, the for instance, the black cells are the ones which indicate the which are using the same frequency. Okay. So, you can see that they are all further away by a much larger distance. Right? So, this is um, so, you can choose different uh, reuse patterns depending on the kind of um, the uh, what do you say the, the traffic that you have and how much of frequencies are available and how you want to distribute them and so on. Okay. So, but this is the basic idea. Okay. Okay. So, now how do I increase the capacity? Now, we have said that so many channels are available 
right and we are allocating certain number of frequencies to each cell ok. Is there some way in which I can increase the capacity if necessary ok. For instance, if there are more than uh, suppose we said we could we could at a time uh, support only 50 calls in a particular cell. Suppose we had to support more than 50 calls what do you do ok. One thing that you could do is um, you could add new channels ok. So, for instance, normally not all channels are used to start with so you could add new channels but that may not be always feasible because um, uh, the the uh, frequencies the spectrum are getting used up quite a bit these days ok. So, it may not be always possible. Another option that we have is what is called as frequency borrowing which means you could take some frequencies from adjacent cells ok. That is if a particular cell is congested that cell could take borrow adjacent fre uh, frequencies from adjacent cells if they are not being used by that particular other cell ok. Or in other words you could assign frequencies dynamically. So, that is also another option that we have. So, another third option that we have is what is called a cell splitting ok. So, this is especially useful when you have a non-uniform distribution of topography and the traffic. So, for instance, in certain areas for instance even a city in a city there are certain areas for instance uh, downtown or a particular uh, township where you may find it is highly congested there are a lot of calls that are going on in that particular area. Whereas, in certain outskirts for instance there may not be so many calls that are there. So, in which case you will have a non-uniform distribution of traffic. So, you can try to see if you can use different sized cells in different areas. So, you can use smaller cells in areas where there is higher use ok. For instance, you could have something like this ok. So, um, your normal cell size is this right, but in areas where you find that there is a higher uh, frequency or higher traffic you can see you can divide it up into much smaller cells. So, you have a same region now divided into much smaller cells ok. So, the original cells is about if it say 6.5 to 13 kilometers ok 1.5 kilometer limit in general. So, you can have um, the smaller cells at a 1.5 kilometer limit right and of course, you will have more number of base stations now because each of these little cells now need to have a base station and you would also have more frequent handoff. Um, handoff now is the is what happens when you move from the, the range of one base station to another base station. So, your call has to be kind of handed off from one base station to another base station. So, if you have smaller cells obviously, as you move there will be more number of handoffs that will have to be done ok. So, that is um, th that is something that you will have to handle in the case of cell spreading, but it helps you to manage the um, traffic with the available set of frequencies. Now, another uh, uh, idea that is used for increasing capacity is what is referred to as cell sectoring. So, in cell sectoring what we do is the cell is divided into uh, wedge shaped sectors. So, that is you have some kind of a directional antenna that is used. So, you do not have a 360 degree transmission, but you have transmission only in a particular angle ok. So, you have what are called as directional antennas. So, now each of these sectors so as uh, as we call them ok they can have their own channel set which is a subset of the cells channels. So, that way you will be able to share the available frequencies even better ok. Uh, another idea is to have what are called as micro cells ok. So, for instance, you move antennas from top of hills and large buildings to tops of small buildings and slides of uh, larger buildings. So, even for instance, lamp posts can be used. So, you form smaller micro cells. The idea is that you can reduce the power even still uh, further right. So, reduced power and it can be good for you know some areas like city streets along roads and inside large buildings. So, you can have micro cells and use these micro cells to imp increase the capacity. See, these are uh, different options that we have. So, in general if you look at how this cellular networks have evolved from the uh, first generation to uh, to the proposed fifth generation that is likely to happen right. So, starting from 1980s so you can see that these dotted lines kind of these dotted uh, areas right they indicate uh, research and standardization that is when there is a lot of work that is happening on some kind of research on that particular technology and standardization. So, once it is standardized it actually gets commercialized and is used. So, you can see that uh, the first generation was started off early in 1980s, but was kind of commercialized around 90s. Second generation you can see up to 2000 it was still under research and standardization, 2000 it has been um, standardized. So, we have GSM, GPRS, EDGE are various standards that have been used in 2G. Then um, 3G aux spectrum auction kind of happened around this time when 2G was standardized. So, at that time you can see that the research for t 3G has almost started. And around 2010 you can see that 3G has been um, has uh, even before that right it is been standardized and 4G for instance has been standardized starting from um, 2012, 13 and so on ok and already work on 5G has been has uh, started ok. And the 
hope is that by 2020, we will be having 5G uh, standards and 5G will probably go on for another 10 years at least. So, yeah, so the technologies that we have with 3G are WCDMA, HSPA, HSPA plus and so on. With 4G, we have what is called as LTE, long term evolution, LTE advanced. Okay, and 5G, we are yet to see what kind of technologies are going to come. Okay. So, if you look at all these different, whatever be the generation that we have, there are certain issues which are vital to cellular. So, if you look at what these issues are, one of course is frequency allocation. So, we have seen that normally the frequency allocation is done in a licensed manner. So, there may be many providers. So, you license out different frequencies to different providers. So, this is something which is common across all uh, generations, which is why you will see that there is an auction of the spectrum that takes place for each generation. Okay? It will be provided. So, you do an auction and, uh, and uh, kind of give, uh, give different frequency bands to different uh, providers. Okay. So, then um, another very important aspect is how we support multiple access because many users are there in a given area and we have we need to have wide area of coverage and we need to do traffic management. All these things have to be done given that we have a multiple access technique. So, what kind of multiple access techniques are suitable? Okay? That is another thing to look at. Third thing to look at is location management, especially when you have high mobility scenarios as when you are traveling by car or train or whatever, then how is it that you are able to support um, mobility, right? Uh, when you have multiple suppliers, how do I support mobility? So, how is this handoff management, especially when you are roaming, right? So, how do you, hand, how do you handle location management or handoff management when you are roaming and so on? So, these are some of the issues that come when you are looking at location management. The general principles we will see are kind of handled a little differently by different generations, but overall these are the issues that have to be handled by, e by any cellular technology. Okay? So, we will take a look at the 2G technology and then we will see how other things handle these different uh, issues. So, if you look at the multiple access techniques, okay, there are few commonly techni used techniques. So, we have what is called as um, time division multiplexing, frequency division multiplexing. right? So, uh, in frequency division multiplexing what do we do? there are the entire channel is divided into frequencies and each frequency band for instance, sub band for instance is given to a different session. So, they use that frequency for the entire duration of time, right. So, you can see if you have time and frequency here, for the entire duration of time this frequency will be used by a particular user or a channel. Now, in time division multiplexing we have, um, you can see that time wise we divide that is the entire set of frequencies is available or a particular frequency is available. And the time wise it is divided, it is used is divided. Okay, this is what is used in our 2G TDMA, time division multiple axis and 3G TDMA and so on. Okay. Right. And then we have what is called a CDMA which is code division multiple axis. So, in CDMA what we do is all sessions can use all the frequencies all the time, right? So, which means all sessions are kind of they share the frequency and the time domain that is available, but they use different codes. And because they use different codes they are able to effectively uh, share the channel without any interference. Okay? So, you need to understand how that happens. It is very easy to understand frequency division and time division multiplexing. Um, code division multiplexing is a little trickier to understand. We will take a look at all the three now. So, if you look at time division multiplexing, very simple. So, access to channel is in rounds. So, you kind of divide the entire time duration that is there into multiple slots. So, okay? And each slot is allocated to a particular station. So, each station gets a fixed length slot and length normally specified in terms of packet transmission time. Okay, in each round. So, you may have many multiple such rounds that we have. Okay. So, um, in this example for instance, um, stations let us say 1, 3 and 4 are transmitting, okay, 2, 5 and 6 are idle. So, the unused slots, right, if 2 and 5 and 6 are not transmitting, those slots will go idle. So, that is one of the disadvantages of TDMA that we have. Okay. Now, in frequency division multiplexing, right, FDMA, uh, multiple axis, see what happens here, we have different frequency bands that are available. So, there are multiple frequency bands which are sharing the same channel, right, same cable. So, the channel spectrum as a whole is divided into frequency bands. Each station is assigned a fixed frequency band and the unused transmission time in the frequency bands will go idle. Just as in TDM the unused slots go idle, here the unused frequency bands will go idle. For instance, here say 1, 3, 4 have a packet. Now, the other 2, 5 and 6 do not have a packet, those lines will go idle, those frequencies are unused. So, so, other techniques that are commonly used you will see are uh, a combination of FDMA and TDMA. That is you divide the spectrum into frequency channels and then divide each channel into time slots. So, this is something which is commonly used. Okay. Another one that is used is CDMA of course, code division multiple axis where uh, you will have frequency slots and time slots okay. and uh, in these frequency slots and time slots the entire um, slots will be used up by the different channels using different codes. Okay. 
So, let us look at this uh, CDMA ok. So, the basic idea here is that each user is given a unique code ok. So, we you can refer to it as some kind of a code set partitioning, partitioning ok. So, these codes are chosen in such a manner that they are orthogonal to one another ok. Um, so, which means all the users could share the same frequency right, but since each of it has is unique code which is called as a chipping sequence which is ok, uh, which is used and that is used to encode data, you will be able to allow multiple users to coexist and transmit simultaneously with minimal interference ok. Now, all this happens because the codes are chosen to be orthogonal to one another. So, remember if they are orthogonal you can always separate them out easily. So, you can look at orthogonal as saying the two vectors when we say they are orthogonal, we say x dot y is 0 right. So, similarly, so that is the same idea that we use. So, if you can represent the codes are vectors as vectors and if you choose these vectors such that they are orthogonal to one another, you have got your codes which are orthogonal to one another. So, by using such codes we can now transmit uh, data simultaneously ok. So, the encoded signal is basically um, found like this that is you take the original data that you have and you multiply it with the chipping sequence. So, that becomes your encoded signal and your decoding signal is the inner product of the encoded signal and the chipping sequence. Now, remember inner product is what I just talked about. If I have two vectors, the dot product of the two vectors is what is called as the inner product. So, you take the encoded signal and you do a dot product of that with the chipping sequence, you will get back your original data right. So, you can just see you are doing the opposite of this. So, you get back your original data right. So, that is the idea. So, we will take a, an example to understand this. So, let us say I have a sender right who is going to be sending some data in slot 0 and slot 1 let us say ok. So, let us say he is sending a 1 in slot 0 and this is his chipping sequence. So, to send a 1 he actually sends a pattern of uh, let me start from here this is the, this is the first bit that is going out let us say. So, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, 1. So, let us say this is the pattern he uses for sending out a 1 ok. Now, in slot 1 right. So, let us say he is sending a value of 0 or let us say it is a minus 1 that he is sending. So, minus 1 normally is used to indicate 0, 1 to indicate 1 for instance. So, minus 1 you can see will be the exact inverse of this. So, you had for instance um, will be the exact opposite of that right and you can see that the channel output that we have over here you can see what is happening here. So, when this um, pattern is sent over in a minus 1 and this is multiplied together what you get over here you can see is you will have 1 1 1 minus 1 1 minus 1 minus 1. You can see that what you have here is the inverted value of whatever we have here ok. So, we can see that you have a slot 0 channel output showing that it is it has encoded a value of 1, slot 1 channel output has encoded a value of minus 1 right. So, that is the output of the channel. So, that is what is happening in this encoding uh, block that we have here. Now, this is transmitted ok and it comes to the receiver. So, at the receiver let us look at what happens ok. At the receiver I am getting this particular uh, data has come in right. So, now at the receiver the code that I have is this, I know that this is the code that I am looking for for instance. So, what I do? I do a dot product of this code and this code. When I do a dot product of this and this, now since all of them are identical, I will get a value of 1 right. So, I know that my slot 0 channel output is 1. And when I do a dot product of this value and this value right, you have 1 here and a minus 1 here. So, what is it you will get when you do a dot product of this? You will get a value of minus 1. So, I know that the data that was transmitted here was a minus 1 ok. So, this is the idea that is used in encoding and decoding of CDMA data. So, let us look at what happens when we have two users sending data simultaneously. Here we saw an example where only a single user was sending. Suppose two users are sending data simultaneously, let us look at what will happen. So, sender 1 has got this code right, sender 2 you can see has a different code right. You can see that uh, the 1 here ok and he is also transmitting a 1, he is also transmitting a 1, but you can see that the codes that are used by the two are different. So, now what will happen is when this will in, in slot 1 when he is transmitting a 1, his 1 will be multiplied by his code sender 2's 1 will be multiplied by sender 2's code right and that value is what will be added here. So, when that is added you can see that you will get in some slots you will get a value of minus 2, in some slots you will get a value of 2 and some slots you will get a value of 0 which means a 1 and a minus 1 kind of cancelled each other out ok. If you had a 1 in both slots one uh, in one chip sequence right you will find that 1 plus 1 will give you 2, minus 1 and minus 1 will give you minus 2, 1 and minus 1 if you had that will give you a 0. So, this is the, the sum output of the um, both these data. So, the channel basically sums together the transmissions by the sender 1 and the sender 2. Now, this summed output is what will be actually be transmitted. So, when this is transmitted, so let us look at how a receiver 1 will be able to receive the data. So, let us say receiver 1 wants to receive the data from sender 1. So, what does he do? He will use the code of sender 1 ok and do a same inner product with the with this 
um, some data that is received. So, look at what what will happen in that case when he does that you will see that you get the uh, uh, he will get in this slot in slot 1 he gets a value of d 0 equal to 1 and in slot 1 he gets a d 0 d, uh, the d value as minus 1 ok. So, so this is how he will be able to identify what was the data that was originally sent by the sender 1 in these slots. Same thing if he were to do with the uh, receiver 2 or for instance if he, if he were to and it with sender 2 he will get the data that was sent by sender 2 ok. So, this is basically how the uh, CDMA mechanism works. So, now coming to the um, 2G network architecture that we have the, the um, so as we saw as we said earlier so we will have multiple base stations and these base stations are connected to what is called as a base station controller. So, you will have one BSC controlling many base stations and these base station controllers in turn are connected to a uh, mobile switching center ok the MSC. Now, the MSC is normally connected to a telephone network the public telephone network by means of what is called as a gateway MSC ok. So, this is the overall structure that we normally have for trans, uh, transmitting voice ok. So, as um, we said earlier the base station is at the center of each cell. So, it has antenna controller and transceivers and it the controller in that handles the entire call process. So, number of mobile units that, that are in you uh, that are used at a time can be any number all that is to be handled by the controller ok. So, the BS as we said is connected to the mobile telecommunicate switching center MTSC and one MTSC can serve multiple BS. And the MTSC to BS link may be wired or it could be wireless, wireless ok. And the uh, switching center right the mobile switching center that is the one which is responsible for assigning voice channels, performing handoffs, monitoring calls, billing all that is handled by the mobile switching center ok. So, there are normally two channels which are used one called the control channel one called the traffic channel. Now, the traffic channel is used to carry voice and some data, the control channels are used to um, set up some the, the set up the call and for maintaining calls and so on. So, they basically establish a relationship between the mobile unit and the nearest base. So, when you switch on the mobile for instance the control channel that is on and this is through the control channel that your device will be talking to the base station that is there in that area ok. So, that is what is we have ok right. So, this is the basic structure. So, now let us look at how we make calls and handle mobility when we uh, in this kind of a simple 2G network. So, if you look at the um, network we normally use certain terms right we talk about something called a home network. Now, home network is the network of the cellular provided you subscribe to for, ex for example, you may be subscribed to Airtel or BSNL. So, that is your home network. So, at the home network right there will be something called a home location register HLR. Now, this HLR is kind of like a huge database which has all information about your uh, calls right. So, network and permanent cell phone number the profile information, what kind of services you have, what are your preferences, your billing details, information about your current location. You may be in some other network right, but where are you currently that information will all be stored in your home location register. So, then we talk about something called a visited network that is the network in which the mobile currently resides. So, let us say you belong to a particular say let us say I belong to Chennai, I am um, moving to let us say I am just traveling to uh, Delhi. So, in which case my th when I contact the Delhi network right that becomes my visited network, Chennai will always remain my home network. So, at the home network there will also be something called a visitor location register right I mean at every um, network there will be something called a visitor location register which keeps track of who are the users who are currently in that particular network. So, when I am roaming in Delhi for instance, so my information will be there in the VLR at Delhi ok. Now, even if I am roaming in I mean if, even if I am not roaming even if I am in my own home network that information also will be at the VLR in the net in my home network right. So, the VLR has complete details about all the people who are there in that particular area who belong to that same area plus those who are visiting ok that is the idea. Okay. So, now let us look at how the um, routing basically will get done. So, let us say we have a caller here calling from some other ne uh, network ok and he is calling through the public switch network ok through the um, through to a particular user the user let us say is here. Now, the user actually belongs to this uh, this network this is the home network, but now he is visiting some other network. So, let us look at what happens first the call will be based on his number will be located will be routed only to his home mobile switching center. But the home mobile switching center will have information that this person is actually roaming in a different area. So, what this will do is it will now consult the HLR find get the roaming number of the mobile in the visited network right and transfer the call to the that mobile switching center right. So, now what this uh, switching center will do is it knows where this person is currently located right through that particular base station to which he is he is connected it will route the call to 
that particular person. Okay. So, this is basically how the call will get uh, completed. Okay. So, let us look at how the handoff will take. This is a very simple example to understand how the routing will be done. Now, let us say he is moving from one network to another. Now, the one other thing that needs to be ha done is ha the handoff. That is how do you hand off the call from one base station to another or from one MSC to another MSC. So, let us look at how that is done. So, handoff for instance is very simple. If you are within the same mobile switching center, control of the same mobile switching center, it is very simple. All you need to do is when you move from one base station to another base station, the old base station will realize that its strength, its signal strength is reducing, right. So, it will be able to immediately, so the device now it can talk to the device, right and it can initiate a handoff to another mobile, to another BSS to which this particular um, user is currently moving, right. So, then the mobile switching center since that is the one which is controlling both these uh, base stations, it will make this transfer possible by routing all the calls from here to here. So, that is a very simple, it is a common MSE, we have absolutely no problem in handling this. Okay. So, let us see uh, um, the what happens when you have this complete set, the various steps that we have here. Okay. So, the first step that we have here will be that the old BSS informs the MSC of a handoff that is about to take place okay. and it provides a list of new BSS to which this can be transferred. So, now the MSC what it does is it sets up the path to the new BSS. So, that is your step 2. Step 3, this new BSS now will allocate a mobile channel for use by this mobile and now it will signal the old uh, BSS right that it is now ready to make the call. So, it just signals the MSC and the old BSS that it is ready to make the call. Now, the old BSS now tells the mobile that okay handoff done, so you can now start talking to the new BSS. So, now the mobile will start talking to the new BSS, activate the new channel and it will also signal to the um, MSC via this new BSS right that the handoff is complete. So, from now onwards it starts um, and the old BSS also now the MSC will indicate that resources can be released. So, that will be released and now the new the mobile now is connected to the new BSS. So, this is what happens. So, when you have different MSCs, so for instance, he is moving from one MSC to another MSC to another MSC. So, what happens here is the first the call will be routed to the first MSC which is called as the anchor MSC, right. Now, when new MSCs add on, you kind of add it on to this chain. So, it will go from here to here and from here it will be sent to this one, okay. You can also do certain uh, optimizations wherein for instance, you can uh, optimize the path by skipping this MSC and going from the anchor MSC to the final MSC to the MSC that you are currently now connected to. Okay. So, these are things that are done to uh, in order to facilitate mobility. Okay. So, these are basically the things that are handled in the 2G um, network. Okay. So, this is the evolution from 2G to 3G. So, we will be looking at how 2G to 3G evolution happens in a subsequent uh, talk. Okay. So, to summarize, we have looked at the overview of cellular technology, the basics of uh, 2G, the 2G architecture and how uh, calls are handled and when mobility is there in uh, in a 2G network. Okay. Thank you.